Today we are very pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Tom Petoglu from PAC. Um, Dr. Petoglu is the director of uh, PAC's design and digital manufacturing program. Uh, this is the business where we try to understand how many things we can do like we do with Google SI, where we can actually write programs and create artifacts and make them. And he is the program manager at PAC and PI for three data projects. The Meta, the IFAB, and the C2M throughout. Okay. The Meta and IFAB is exactly the program that we're trying to make linear vehicles by this process. And it's another one that's quite happy to make. So he has published quite a few papers. He is active in several societies. And before joining PARC, he was a researcher at NASA and Health Corporation. So today he will talk to us about exactly this topic, intelligent digital manufacturing, choosing the gap between design and manufacturing, which, by the way, Depends critically on systems that you may have more than systems you Thanks, John. Okay. So, John and I actually met about a year ago when I was visiting this and talking about the Tarko project and what Park is doing with the Davia program. Since then, uh, I've hired one of the students at Park and uh, we've been in touch talking uh, about model based systems engineering challenges, uh, projects, and uh, uh, went after a couple of government opportunities uh, to talk about and whatnot. So, Pleased to be here. Uh, I know we've been thinking uh, a lot about the similar kinds of problems, um, which is what, what we do at PARC. Uh, the program that I predict called Design and Digital Manufacturing has uh, a pretty diverse research portfolio that pertains to systems engineering uh, and manufacturing. Uh, you know, we, we have research projects in uh, CAD, uh, in modeling and simulation, in intelligent manufacturing, uh, control sensors, uh, uh, planning. Scheduling. Uh, the gist of the program is basically applying computation uh, techniques to engineering design and manufacturing programs. So that's sort of one, one sentence summary of what we do. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a very narrow uh, uh, part of that portfolio, which focuses on uh, just one particular project. Uh, if you guys are interested in some of the other stuff that we do, I'll be happy. I'm, I, I'm here for the rest of the afternoon, the rest of the day, so I'll be happy to talk about uh, some of the other projects that we have apart. Space. Uh, my talk is organized into two parts. Uh, at the very beginning, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Park's manufacturing vision. We have been thinking heavily about uh, uh, some of the emerging paradigms in, uh, in design, innovation, and manufacturing, and how that's shaping up the future of manufacturing. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that, and then I'll jump over to the particular project and particular research that we've been doing in linking design and manufacturing understanding supply chains. So uh, with that, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> so what, what we've been thinking about at PARC and, and, and what we're observing uh, with the emerging ecosystem about uh, design, innovation, and manufacturing is that manufacturing is changing uh, from what it is today, which is highly monolithic and highly central uh, with, with certain uh, business enterprises. And that's being challenged in multiple different ways. What we're seeing is it's becoming more and more complex. Obviously, it's becoming more digital, agile, and democratized. And I want to highlight this democratization angle quite a bit because there's a lot of um, emerging trends, companies, and business models that are being formed uh, in Silicon Valley and other parts of the country uh, that are actually focusing on just making that aspect of it. And, and in a nutshell, what that means is making uh, you know, bringing different roles, different stakeholders in the whole holistic uh, process of design, innovation, and manufacturing, and making uh, increasingly easier, easier to use technologies accessible to these different players. What that means is that the boundaries between, you know, who is the inventor, who is the designer, who is the consumer, who is the fabricator is becoming fuzzier and fuzzier. People have more access to uh, to, to expertise, you, know, you, don't have to, you no longer have to be an expert in, I don't know, chemicals to be able to design something that involves, you know, sophisticated chemical aspects. Um, they have easier access to capital with uh, newly forming uh, capital allocation forms, like, you know, uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo and those kinds of things. If you have an idea, if you want to invent something, you can actually have easier access to, uh, to, to capital and fundraising. And obviously, uh, you have easier access to manufacturing resources with, uh, with, uh, you know, with 3D printing uh, and other rapid prototyping technologies and whatnot. A lot of those source, uh, resources can be dynamically configured according to uh, an individual's and enterprises or uh, small and medium uh, enterprises' needs. 
and uh, can, can, can actually produce new products. And what that means is, 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 is basically it provides a much higher level of customization compared to, to that today. Uh, we're seeing examples of this uh, everywhere. And, and also, hopefully, a much higher performance capabilities that are not attainable today uh, with these you know, changing manufacturing networks. And I talked about access a little bit. We view this in multiple dimensions. So there's, there's more, obviously, there's more power accessible uh, to do things in manufacturing in a more efficient way. Uh, information in IT is the backbone. Uh, it's, it's, it, it has not been the backbone of manufacturing, in my view, but it's starting to be the backbone of manufacturing so that you can link designs and inventions to manufacturing capabilities, supply chain capabilities, and those kinds of things. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is uh, with notions like crowdsourcing uh, and uh, innovation help and those kinds of things, people have immediate access to expertise and know-how in areas uh, that they're not experts in. And that's, that's very, very uh, important. Complexity is accessible, um, especially with the emergence of 3D printing. Uh, you can actually generate and prototype shapes that you were never able to before. Uh, some people claim that's, that's free. I've been in multiple talks that people claim complexity is free in 3D printing. I do not believe that. In fact, we have a project on 3D printability analysis that looks at complex geometries and really um, uh, assesses how, uh, you know, how feasible it is to be, to be 3D printed. And then economic complexity is accessible. Again, there's the emergence of on-demand supply chains, uh, on-demand value chains, uh, uh, and, and uh, capital. And if you put all of those together, if people want to invent today and design a new product and whatnot, um, you know, they have the economic models and business models uh, at their expense as well. Uh, one example of that I talked about, uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, which is you know crowdfunding company. There's another company called, for example, Dragon Innovations uh, that specializes in supply chain formation in China. And if you if you have an idea, if you build a prototype, if you want to scale it up to, to mass production and whatnot, they'll actually help you on demand to, to really build your supply chain depending on your specific needs. So all of that, you know, if you take all of that together, it means you know again, um, uh, it means that um, all the boundaries between the consumer, the designer, the inventor, the manufacturer, all of this, that is getting more and more uh, fuzzy. And, uh, and, and a lot of different stakeholders have access to these kinds of manufacturing te technologies. Not only that, it's becoming more and more particip participatory. And uh, the ADM program, one of the pillars of the ADM program that John had mentioned was, was exactly that. You, know, you no longer have to be a systems engineer in in DIE or you know general dynamics land systems to, to be to be able to participate in the design of a military you know military vehicle and uh, a lot of the, that expertise can be can be also distributed to them through outsource and we see a lot of those things happening as well where people come together uh, to to invent and design together as well as to build the, the associated manufacturing and supply chain networks. And uh, what this slide summarizes is some of the emerging trends in, in, in those areas. So we, we think about this, these three pillars for the future of manufacturing. There's, there's a lot of new technologies that are emerging on the design side with next generation CAD, you know, easier to use CAD tools and, and, and hides the complexity from the user so more people can actually express uh, themselves and create and edit shapes and things like that. There is an emergence in collaborative tools as opposed to, you know, monolithic single uh, design tools where multiple people can come together and interact with one another. Um, there's a number of startups in that area as well. Um, there is an emergence in uh, simulation modeling and verification tools, uh, making them accessible on the web and, and other places. And analytics is becoming also an important piece of, just like everything else, design process where consumer preferences are being monitored and, 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 and put on a mathematical foundation so that one Companies can take advantage of customers' preferences in, in shape, aesthetics, and other kinds of things, and design things accordingly. On the make side, there's a number of um, there's a number of emerging trends. Obviously, 3D printing is one of them, which is uh, you know at the hype of the uh, at the tip of the hype curve right now. But it's a very important technology going forward. Digital manufacturing, uh, which I'll touch upon a little bit. Um, industrial robotics, um, you know, uh, with um, Rethink robot, robotics and, and, and companies like that, where increasingly robots have capabilities to to learn and to get better at what they do, as opposed to this traditional way of uh, doing the task that they're pressed out to do. Um, we and, and materials innovation obviously is, is a big component on the main side.
site as well. And we at Park work on uh, materials innovation quite a bit and, and tying that, thinking about the next generation of uh, 3D printing, which, which is an umbrella that we have on the printed electronics where we're looking into not only being able to print metals and uh, plastics and structural elements, but be able to print uh, intelligence along with the structural elements, uh, circuits and electronics and those kinds of components along with the structural and mechanical elements all in one process and, and there's a lot of research going on there. And finally, the real power in my mind comes from not only these sort of isolated capabilities that are emerging, but being able to connect them in meaningful ways using things like crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. Marketplaces is another one. There's a number of companies uh, that, are, uh, that are forming or have been formed uh, that tries to really uh, uh, into connect these different capabilities and uh, stakeholders in this, in this ecosystem. And I think that's, that's really interesting to look at as well. And all of that, if you think about, has a huge impact in terms of, uh, you know, the way of making things and and, uh, and also um, the economy. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some technology impact. There's going to be more and more complex and more highly functional, highly integrated uh, products uh, that would be accessible. There's going to be a strategic impact. You know, we see a lot of on-demand, uh, really custom. Um, uh, uh, capabilities and, and products being uh, developed in a very, very rapid fashion. Um, and as, I, as I talked about, there's going to be an economic impact because if you think about this really hard, you'll see that the, the leverage shifts from the, the, the mass produced models, which is a cookie cutter model, you know, you, you do 10,000 million of one thing, now you're, you're moving towards more of a long tail model where a lot of things are done in small lot quantities and highly customized and whatnot. So that has a huge economic implication because uh, because it challenges one of the fundamental economic theories that you know which is you know uh, 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 which, which is on scale uh, or economies of scale and then finally the one I'm, I'm most excited about is the societal impact because you know with with, with these kinds of emergence with, with people um, from different uh, socioeconomic demographics and groups are being more uh, participant and involved in the design and, and, and manufacturing and innovation processes uh, it's really a, a very, very powerful um, uh, collection of things that are going on to be able to educate uh, uh, people on and get them excited about careers, about uh, you know making things and those kinds of notions. So, so, so that's how we see the future of, of manufacturing shaping up. And um, what I want to talk about next is basically the one piece of that because a lot of that really informs how we think about our current projects going forward. So the the opportunity or the project that I'm going to talk about is about connecting design and meaning. And that's about really understanding adaptive manufacturing networks. So what we want to be able to do is to be able to give people tools so that they can virtualize uh, manufacturing networks and supply chains and their capabilities um, and, and optimize them. You know, first virtualize and then optimize and analyze them uh, so that they can smoothly transition from design to manufacturing and, and, and do a lot of these verifications in a, in a virtual fashion as opposed to you know, the traditional fashion. And there's, there's another question one needs to answer. You know, if you want to get a part made today, uh, a product made today, uh, there are fundamental questions that you need to be answered. You know, who can make it is one of the most fundamental ones. Uh, you may think that's an easy question to answer, but it is still not. Um, how will they make it? How, how likely are they to succeed? Uh, where it will be made? Uh, how fast and would it be profitable um, for the for the for the designers or people that are demanding those parts, as well as for the suppliers and the manufacturers that are making that? So we started thinking about this pro uh, problem when we were involved uh, with the DARPA project called IPAD a couple of years back, and uh, and there we were looking at the uh, at the acquisition uh, process of the defense uh, 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 department of defense and, and really understanding how uh, it can be improved in terms of uh, time uh, and in terms of cost complexity. And uh, from there on, it had evolved into, into this notion of adaptive manufacturing networks and really helping answering some of these questions, which is, which is the, the research questions that we're asking. So, and our main focus has been the machine so far. Um, so traditional subtractive uh, manufacturing, if you will. And if you look at the opportunity in numbers, uh, which, is, which is something that we do at Park quite a bit because ultimately, one of our ultimate goals is not to, um, not to um, 
only stay in the scientific and the technical realm, but also to commercialize those technologies that comes out of our research. And if you look at the opportunity numbers in this case, uh, it's, it's, it's quite big, and, and particularly uh, with respect to the, uh, to, the, to the number of suppliers as well as the buyers uh, and, uh, and the sourcing people who are tasked with finding uh, capable suppliers and whatnot. So today, the way, the way it pretty much works is this, there's a lot of cycle between design and manufacturing and uh, uh, between the, the buyer's side on this side and, and, and identifying the suppliers and onboarding them so that they have a supply chain that can deliver the product. And uh, what, we're, what we're interested in serving both the design side as well as the supply side, the supply side is also really, really interesting. If you think in terms of, especially in terms of small and medium businesses, the opportunity is, is very, very, uh, very, very big. There's about 20 to 30,000 shops in the U.S. that can actually have, that have capabilities to make things, but they're not necessarily connected uh, in a digital infrastructure to be able to be a player to have even the right to play in providing in a much more efficient way uh, what, uh, what the design of the buy side needs. And that's a fundamental problem. And just for machining only, we're talking about 30 to 40 billion dollar a year industry um, and with, with some projected growth as well. So it's a huge opportunity to address if you can actually be able to connect uh, you know, the design side with the, with the make side. So how is it done today? Uh, because that's, that's the heart of the problem. And, and it is the fact that it's very, very inefficient. So if you want to, if you want to get a part made today, you have to follow a certain process. So you have to take your CAD file, which is pretty standard. You have to send it out um, in a process called RFQ request for code. And you have to do this not only with one supplier, but you have to do it with multiple suppliers. Because in almost all cases, you want to get costing and codes back from multiple uh, potential uh, players. Um, large OEMs usually have select few suppliers that they have been working with. If you are different, if you want to innovate as a consumer yourself, uh, you know, your challenge, the challenge is much higher. So that goes out to the supply side, and uh, they look at the design from a manufacturer's point of view. They have to look at it and say, well, yes, we can make it, or no, we can't make it because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, once they do that, they also need to do a sort of a rough, high level, what I call a process estimate or process plan. Uh, to be able to get back numbers uh, to the buy side. And once they do that, they, they basically feed that back as a code. And if the design on the buy side likes it, they give it a main order, and then from there on, it's, it's more, you know, you're going to be cutting metal in our case. So you have to go into more detailed process planning. You have to think about fixturing. You have to think about machine codes and all sorts of details. And finally, you make it and ship it. And all of this process takes quite a while, and it's a very iterative process in which a lot of negotiations happen between, uh, between the designers, the manufacturers, uh, you know, the sourcing people, as well as the, the fabricators, machinists, and what have you. And what we wanted to tackle was capture knowledge that goes into a lot of these uh, process steps and make it available and easily accessible uh, so that we can automate and we can help people reason about some of those decision making that's going on. So what are some of the bottlenecks for the design side and the make side? So for the design side, finding and onboarding capable suppliers is a very, very big problem. This is particularly a big problem for DOD. They have been working on it with multiple programs, you know, for as long as I remember. Um, it's also very difficult to know how much you should expect for a part to be made. That's called shoot cost in industry. Uh, and it ranges, you know, we have a number of industrial partners, and it can range anywhere from uh, you know, order of magnitude difference from between different supplies for the very same part. And uh, a lot of the supply chains is also rigid, right? So we view this as sort of a network, but a lot of companies have been doing business with the same set of supplies that they had. They have no idea of knowing unless they go through the very time consuming process to, to really explore a much larger uh, potential pool of capable suppliers and, and supply chains. On the make side, um, you know, there's a number of bottlenecks too. You know, first of all, they want to know whether they can make it very, very quickly. Um, we have been talking to a quite big number of small and medium businesses, and the talent and the talent acquisition challenge is one of the biggest challenges that they have. A lot of people that knows how to make things are retired and uh, without uh, qualified replacement for themselves, and uh, and that poses a big problem. And we're uh, also an opportunity for technology to help uh, by providing them with easier to use, easier to train tools so that they can actually 
uh, compensate for some of that skill loss. Um, they're also ultimately interested in their margins and productivity, right? If you're, if you're a shop owner, if you're running a shop, you want to run that in a very, very productive manner so that you can hit your margins and keep your business afloat. Um, the other thing that came out of our user studies is the coding piece. You know, I, I described that in the previous slide. That is the single most uh, biggest piece of the overhead that they have. And if you think about it, it, it makes sense because if they get, suppose they get uh, tens of these codes that they have to respond to, in order to gain that business or be competitive for that business, they have to respond to all of those. And they spend hours in, in putting the process plans together, you know, filling out the RFQ sheets, and et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't guarantee that they will get the business. So they have to really invest in that no matter what. And that's a big overhead that we want to also eliminate. And um, so in, in, in our examples, and we looked at SMBs and large OEMs and their supply chains and internal R&D shops, uh, external shops, high production shops, there are a variety of different shops of different nature and the design houses. Uh, and uh, they all said the same thing. So this process can actually take, um, you know, and stretch on for weeks uh, at times. So, and that's the problem that we want. These are the bottlenecks that we wanted to address. So, but it's not really very really straightforward. So there's a number of technical challenges that you have to think through uh, in order to really build a network and connect them uh, in a meaningful fashion. Uh, and and, and it, just like any other computational problem, it starts with the representation. So you have to be refined with appropriate representation scheme so that you can apply a multitude of reasoning algorithms and approaches uh, and, uh, and to, to, to those representation schemes. The other thing is um, this, this, this whole PLM industry and CAD and CAM, CAM industry is very um, fragmented in a sense that, that there's a different tool uh, that different um, OEMs and uh, design houses and, and manufacturers use, uh, both on the CAD side CAE side and, and the CAM side, and the interoperability between them and feeding information back and forth between them is, is very, very difficult. So we wanted to basically, we have to stop and think, you know, are there any ways that we can be agnostic to some of the preferences that they have so, can, so we can build a, actually a scalable solution from the get-go. Um, you have to do a lot of reasoning. Uh, we, we chose to do that in, in a model-based fashion by modeling. Um, the supply side uh, and linking the designs to that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, also, the speed of computation. I mean, you can do this matching. Uh, there are ways to do that today. There are marketplaces that exist today, but they work pretty much manually. So, you know, uh, they, they're pretty much billboards for people to post IFQs and the suppliers can look at them, but they still need to go through that manual process of looking them and sorting them out, etc., etc. We wanted to be able to do this in real time. So we wanted to actually, what we wanted to be able to do is draw the design file and associated manufacturing data, have a back end populated with a bunch of suppliers, the network, if you will, and be able to do that in, in, in instantly, can tell who can make it with what confidence and how, right? And that's not, that's not easy to, to, do, to be able to do that in, in real time. And, and also, process improvement is important because, especially for SMEs, they have a high adoption Warrior, if you will, you know, they say, well, we've been doing this for, for, for ages, the way we do it. I have my guru guy in the shop that knows how to, you know, cost things, etc., etc. We use Excel sheets. You know, we're fine, we're covered. So you have to really provide them an integrated solution that sort of challenges that mindset a little bit, which is proven, you know, to be uh, very, very hard. And, and one way of doing that is to provide, again, integrated solutions. The other way to do that is to, to show that you can actually increase their automation capabilities and save them time and increase their productivity, which have, we have in targeting as well. And then the final, well, final two aspects of it, you have to generate results that are shop-specific. So, because only then it becomes meaningful to, to do this sort of capability matching in a network setting, right? So if you, if you work off of best practices and heuristics and whatnot in doing this matching, then you're not really generating, you're not doing real matching, if you want. And that's one of the problems that people come in into these marketplaces and say, you know, they have been processing, they have been machining aerospace parts for so long and what have you, um, um, you know, without providing any additional detailed information. And that doesn't necessarily mean for any given part they'll be able to do it just as well. So, so you have to basically encode some of the resources <coughs> and supply chain constraints and things like that, and then that way you can actually link actual design to actual shop specific capabilities, which is what we do. Uh, finally, the deployment needs to be 
flexible, especially from a, a cost of ownership point of view. Again, uh, we're targeting a lot of the SMBs. Uh, they, can, they, they cannot afford to invest in large PLM tools just like the big companies can. You know, we're not talking about GEs and Boeings and Rolls Royces of the world here. We're talking about um, you know, small and medium enterprises that really require a different way of uh, delivery method. And we've been ex experimenting with software as a service there as a fundamental deployment model. And then finally, you know, it needs to be easy to use and easy to get people trained on it um, so that they, you know, so that you can lower the adoption of it if you will. So that's what we do. Well, we call it UFAP. Um, and and as, as I said, so it started very early generations of it. We're generation three now started with the DACO program. Um, um, and, and it has evolved quite a bit since then. What it is is, is, is basically a tool uh, that can consume a step file, which is a um, cat tool neutral format for, uh, for, uh, for design. And then you can do this real time analysis of manufacturability. And it, you know, it generates estimates for manufacturing time and cost, you know, lead time and, uh, and uh, uh, manufacturing cost, if you will, by linking the design with supplier specific shop location. So we wanted, like I said, so one of the fundamental objectives that we had at the beginning was to do this as a shop specific, at a shop specific level. So how does it work? So there's a number of inputs. First of all, we wanted to create this network. We generate the step file. We get the step file. That's an important assumption. It is an important assumption. It is not user friendly, and it is all kind of bad stuff. It's correct. That's correct. So, uh, but that was the trade-off between Sorry. doing it in a non-native CAD environment. No, it's very, it's very true. Right. So, um, so the first thing uh, that, that it takes as input is the supply information. And I'm going to skip some, through some of this because I want to show you a demo. But we we ask each of the suppliers, and we have underlying representations of the machines, of the cutting tools, of the uh, resources that they have uh, that we have developed. We, we, we hide some of that complexity from them, and we ask them to basically take from a pre-populated library, uh, and in the back end, we, we actually know the uh, manufacturer uh, specifications for that particular machine. You know, if they have a Mazak machine versus a you know, Bridgeport machine, we know all the differences in power settings and things like that. So we ask them to basically give some of this information, and there's been some discussion going on that had happened between us and, and NIST, actually, about really capturing um, this kind of information from the, from the suppliers. And then the second piece is, is, is the step information. You know, you, you have to sort of drop it into the website. And um, tolerance is big in, in, um, in um, identifying which suppliers can, can um, make it, uh, even, even acceptance rate and whatnot. So we ask the, the buyers to, to select the physical uh, tolerance is obviously the material choice. And then we have two different modes that we run. In some cases, you can actually select the supplier that you have and then run the analysis. In other cases, you can leave it open and then we can run it against a bunch of capable shops and identify which ones can make it for you. The outputs are um, uh, highly visual. So we, get, we give uh, qualitatively different machining plants. You, know, these are, you can think of them as different recipes for making the part. Um, uh, and there's some details associated with that. So in machining, you have to really think about um, the setup orientations, which machines you put the part on, in what order, uh, what are the cutting tools that you use for, um, you know, for roughing operations, for finishing operations, and things like that. And then more importantly, what are some of the process parameters, right? Uh, like uh, uh, depth of cut and feeds and speeds and those kinds of things are very, very, uh, are very, very important. And we, give, we put a lot of this information on, on the website and, uh, and give them some visualization capabilities so that they can follow this. And remember, one of the goals was for, for, to give them a virtual way of verifying and validating uh, the plans and, and, and identifying any manufacturability issues beforehand, even before you supply the part or release the part for an RFP. Do you have a standardized process for quality evaluation? Well, what you may make but they may not make it to the point of view part. Right, so, so yes, so what we do is we do um, the basic tolerance analysis and tolerance stack up analysis right. to link it with GDMP and to link that with uh, estimated acceptance rates. Do you use historical data on them or how do you pass it to the tech? 
we just estimate that. We don't know whether our we haven't done any validation whether our estimation. Because when we were doing IPPD, that would be totally. Right. Just like that thing. And then, right. and then, and then the main manufacturer will go to the shops and do own inspections. Sure. And they do it every six months and so on and so forth. Sure. And if you are not doing this quality, you drop it. Right. In supply chain. And even from the possibility of doing what you're asking. Right. So, yeah. so that's, we have a separate project that sort of looks at that um, using some machine learning techniques. But you're right. So you have to look at the historical data and then tailor that data in a shop specific process capabilities. And uh, assess how well they, they, they have it's been. It's even more important, I believe, in the web because there can be a lot of people making a lot of claims and then they may not be able to deliver. Right. Um, the point that you want. There's, there's other ways of uh, addressing that, not directly, but indirectly by building uh, uh, like community uh, voting and those kind of things. So, but it's, it's I, you know, I agree with you, it's a, it's a big problem. So, let me show a quick demo. Um, of the tool as it stands today. Uh, so this is how the website looks like. Uh, I'm running it on my uh, local machine here. If anybody wants to play with the students or whatnot, send me an email. Uh, we have uh, we have it posted on a part cloud so they can have access. Uh, we'll just create a username and password for you. Um, as I said, it works with a step file. Just sort of drop the step file, um, and you can visualize the part, get a basic feel for the dimensions of the part. Uh, so this part is one of our DOD partners. It's a vehicle suspension system part. Um, you have to specify the material. You understand different types of materials. Obviously, all of this information in the back end can be handled with new information as it becomes available or necessary. Um, it, uh, it has a machine library. So each of these instances is essentially a collection of machines. You know, uh, shop one versus shop two versus shop three, if you will. Um, uh, just for testing purposes, I'm going to select the generic uh, uh, shop, which has uh, basic uh, horizontal and uh, vertical uh, milling machines that are the most common ones. Same thing with the tools. We work with actual tool geometry, so we have to have a library or a list of cutting tools that each of these shops have. That's another asset, asset that they have. And then once you pick that, you click on uh, getting the estimate. And I'll talk about the algorithms that happens in the background, but what it comes back with is five different plants, we call them qualitative different plants that represents again the recipe or the or the steps one needs to follow if you want a machine as part. So we're talking about subtractive manufacturing here, I picked one of the plants. So the the sort of pinkish color represents the what's called the roll stock, which is when what you start with. And you have to think about if you if you think about this part, so let me uh, let me remove that. You can come in different directions, right? You can you can start from the top, you can start, you know, from the bottom and what have you. And each of them have different consequences in terms of how it impacts the cost and time of, of processing the part. And that's what our search algorithm essentially goes through. Um, so you can you can follow these steps one by one um, to look at different uh, different plants. The blue uh, the blue volumes represents the removal volume for each of the stages. The green ones are the finishing operations. Uh, for each of the stages, you can sort of see here. You know, you start from the top, do the, you know, remove some of the material here, flip the part, uh, do the back uh, of the part again with finishing, and then come from top and uh, and then finish that. So you can look at different um, different plants. Again, this one is a four setup plant uh, as opposed to a three setup plant. Uh, the same thing here. Uh, you can sort of look at the progression of the uh, of the operations. Um, you know, to be able to remove all of the removal volume and, and, and produce this part. What I haven't shown you is, um, is essentially some of the details of each of those plants. So you can click on each of these steps. It will tell you what machine, uh, what set of machines can do it, uh, what are the exact tooling that have been picked for each of these setups and orientations, what uh, volume has been removed, and it doesn't display the speeds and feeds and some of the process parameters, but it obviously it's been computed uh, so that they can be rolled into the uh, cost and time estimates. Um, the nice thing about this is um, you, can actually, you can actually change, uh, it's kind of hard to read the numbers, but if you change from this generic to a very, uh, you know, we have a very, very modest, I would say, uh, tool shop part. Um, which doesn't have specific tools 
to actually cut this growth on this part, on the back side. So if you do this analysis, you, you can immediately see uh, you can go through a number of different steps, but at the end, the part would be not <coughs> We also display the, uh, uh, the remaining volume uh, for the part. So. If you have two plants that can make it, you create them according to some sort of manufacturability. They have associated time and cost. So we don't rank order them or say, but we display five. Five is an arbitrary number. We can increase that. We can do a bunch of them. But we have um, a metric that puts a quality distinction between the plants. So it's a metric reason to Yes. To judge the difficulty of manufacturing. Yes. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me just show one more part. Another part. Um, this one is from a different partner. Uh, I believe this was a five or six setup part. Is there a software that can make the step five? I know this is not your area, but I can make this top the step five from sketch. You can make the step five from sketch. Um, if I sketch, there the is thing. research that's going on in that that we're interested in. So that's two D two D conversion is one of the bottlenecks that exists today. Uh, if you have a CAD, any CAD tool today can save and step. But if you're working off of a 2D drawing, then it becomes a little bit of a challenge to go to step. And we're, you know, we're cognizant of that pack and work with that. So, uh, so again, this is a different part. Um, you know, you can you can sort of look at um, let me show you the piece. If you pick this particular supplier with generic machines and what's called the Niagara cutters, which we realize is pretty commonly used for SMBs. It's about 250 cutting tools that are pretty commonly used. You can sort of see the, the, the sort of reddish area. So you don't have, you actually have uh, tool length problems and access problems for, uh, for all the areas that are highlighted in red. So you can sort of see the beauty of this if you're a designer and if you work with a specific set of shops um, that are in your supply chain, you can, before releasing this part, you can actually get a feel for what parts of your of your design would present them a problem from a manufacturability point of view. There's, there's, there's a lot of value in that. Um, so if you were to change um, change the, 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 the tool set to uh, generic, uh, which is a much larger set, you'll actually see that this can be done. Um, right. uh, you also have options for integrating 3D printed models from the various types of either cloud or other places that can be Yeah, so that's a great question. So, so you mean, Post machining on three different I mean, uh, if you're a designer, like you said, and you're using this tool to estimate your manufacturability of your part, um, in addition to getting three local machine shops, estimates, quotes, times, can you also have the option of using one of the uh, resources that will 3D print it for you? So then you know the geometry is okay, but it might be more expensive or whatever right. to compare. So they're not linked, but we have another project in which we're developing a tool called UFAC Editing that does the similar analysis for 3D printing. So it's essentially a printability analysis tool. Um, if you were to run it uh, with that tool, um, you can actually answer whether it can be printed or not. So you would use the two tools? The two tools are very similar in spirit, uh, in, 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 a, in the fact that they model the process constraints, and, um, and then they map that to the design. So in 3D printing, for example, your nozzle size, your wall thicknesses, your material selection, um, Etc. Etc. Those kinds of things would impact whether you would be able to print the part as uh, as designed, uh, and that's what that focuses on. But in your scenario, those two tools are not integrated. So it won't say, "Hey, there's a problem here in machining. You might look, you might want to look at 3D printing." But if they use them in tandem, they get the answer. So let me let me go back to the um, to the back to the presentation. So what I showed you was sort of a sort of a single shop example, if you will, uh, and we can go from a single shop to a network. I mean, uh, that's, what we're, that's what we've been trying to do, uh, building this network where we model multiple suppliers uh, in, in an in a open ecosystem or a closed ecosystem, depending on the desire, and then have this very same capability to drop in a part and uh, specify some of the stuff, the tolerances, the, the material, and, and whatnot. And each of these instances essentially are what I picked from the drop-down menu. So there are different shops, you know, we, we sort of anonymize them um, using letters. 
that has different gross curve machines and different gross curve cutting tools and with different costing factors. And uh, our tool would analyze all of them and, uh, and it will map out if they can manufacture the part, it will map out the, their, their lead time versus their uh, coding back uh, to the designer so you can get a feel for, uh, again, the true cost management for who can make it in, in a network and whatnot. So we're building the data with, with some partners, the, the interface for uh, this, this double-sided network on the buy side and the, and the supply side. Again, the suppliers need to come in. They have to pull in their, fill in their information from a library. They have to pick what machines that they have, which cutting tools, uh, some of the costing parameters and things like that. So that you know, we have a pre-populated list of, uh, list of um, suppliers. In that. And then we, we are working with a number of uh, organizations to really create pilot clusters of, of this kind of a network. One of them is in. Uh, Northern California uh, by a of devices manufacturers and all that. So just to summarize all of that, so what we what we wanted to be able to do was to quickly connect buyers with the right um, you know makers in, in sort of a network fashion. So on the design side, it enables a number of things. So it enables that, that you can very fast identify capable suppliers. You can you can do a much accurate true cost management. Uh, you, you obviously increase your time to market if you work to iterate virtually on your design as opposed to releasing it for manufacturing. On the main side, uh, it takes a lot of that overhead out of the IFQ uh, processing. Uh, it gives them a web based tool so that they can um, you know, uh, educate some of their workers um, and uh, expand businesses with, uh, with, with, um, uh, more easily. And obviously, time as well. Um, what we wanted to be also do is the, this, this communication uh, between design and make, right? So that's a very iterative process, a very time and high cost, uh, costly, uh, and that, that's what we addressed as well. In terms of the deployment and the service model, uh, we've been using a cloud-based model where everybody can access if they have a, a web connection and whatnot. So from that, I will um, talk a little bit about how it works um, and some of the science behind it that, that John asked with, with uh, computational geometry. So one of the first decisions that we had to make was about the representation. So there's been a lot of computer-aided process planning work that had happened, you know, some of which goes a couple decades back. A lot of it is based on feature-based representation. So if you have a part, you say this is a hole, this is a slot, this is what, what have you. And then you define your part in terms of depressions and protrusions. Uh, but if you do that, it's very hard to get to arbitrary geometry. We want to move away from that. Um, the other challenge is each, each of those features, if you have a predefined feature set, match to multiple processes and tools. When it comes to computational processing, it becomes a, a challenge from a scalability point of view. The other representation, obviously, that is the de facto standard for CAT is uh, boundary representation. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been widely accepted for CAT world, for those of you who are familiar with uh, you know, geometry modeling um, and computational geometry. Uh, you can actually do reason about these removal volumes using uh, what's called the you know, Minkowski difference. And it's a very uh, com uh, complex computation to make uh, using the uh, boundary representation as the underlying representation. Uh, because as you compute it, uh, things like uh, topological problems emerge, you know, like uh, self intersecting uh, surfaces and, and whatnot, which makes the problem very, very uh, hard uh, from a, a tractability point of view. So what we decided is, uh, remember, we wanted speed, we want real time. We said we're going to go with a feature-free representation. We're not going to call any features in the geometry. We want to be able to represent removal volumes because that's the essential um, uh, element that we want to reason about. Uh, and we want to be able to scale uh, both computationally as well as being able to represent uh, geometries with different complexities. So, and we went with, with the voxel representation and uh, it, it gives us a way to very quickly compute these removal volumes, which is what we wanted to do. So, but nothing comes for free. Obviously, there is a trade-off, and the trade-off is in the accuracy. With voxel representation, you cannot get the same accuracy as in the boundary representations. However, that was not a showstopper for us because we're talking, we are using this in the context of uh, process planning, and that uh, giving up a little bit on the accuracy side for speed of computations and scalability. Was, was acceptable to us. So what does voxels bring to the, to the game? So what, what it brings is, is, is a number of things. First of all, you can represent geometry as an implicit function. And, and that, that's very valuable because every computation that you, have, you will make becomes a membership test. 
which is very, very fast. You know? Am I in the voxel? Am I outside of the voxel? Am I at the boundary of the voxel? The other thing is you can use some of the signal processing uh, methods uh, that are pretty fast. In particular, you can use things like convolution um, to measure overlap between volumes, 3D volumes, and, and do that in a very, very fast fashion. So, which is what we wanted to do because ultimately our reasoning scheme requires us to take a cutting tool and really understand the overlap of that cutting tool in an arbitrary removal volume, which is, which is the heart of the problem. And that's what we did. You know, we used convolution to really reason about the removal volumes uh, for a particular uh, geometry. So, and the way we do that is we take a particular orientation and a particular tool geometry and uh, we basically compute um, what's called the visibility and then from there accessibility of, uh, of, that, of the tool. Here in this, in this plot, uh, this shows the tool geometry, so this is sort of the tip of the tool. This is the part in, in, in one voxel dimension. I don't know which dimension it is in this case. Um, but uh, the red curve mm -hmm. represents the difference between the tip of the tool to the, um, to the boundary of the removal volume, if you want. And we can compute this using static images, 2D images, and, and using some of the uh, signal processing uh, capabilities. Um, so from there, we can actually simulate the, the movement of the cutting tool uh, from where it stands to actually uh, the boundary of the, of the part uh, by moving it in, and sweeping it in any direction. We do this in three dimensions. And that actually guarantees that we come up with a plan uh, by exploring different orientations and tool combinations that would be collusion-free, which is very, very important. So again, so we take the step model, we do a little bit of triangulation, uh, we pick the particular tool orientation here because you can approach the part from multiple directions, and then from, uh, and then from there we compute uh, what's called height maps, uh, which I've shown before, and combine and check for collusion. And that gives us basically what I call the, the fundamental building blocks. It gives us basically collusion-free sub-volumes that can be removed for every pair of, of, a, of a selection of a tool and an orientation. So those are the three sweeps. And we put them in an area. So we, we compute them only once because we didn't want to we didn't want to um, we didn't want to um, expand the search space. So we compute that uh, pre-search just once. And then we add them to an area uh, in order to search that area uh, later on. And once we exhaust the tool and orientation pairs, then we have our area and then we employ a, a search process to come up with those qualitatively distinct plans. And that, the, the conceptual formulation of that search is a set color problem. Here, it, it's, it's very simple. Think about each of these dots as a sub volume that needs to be removed, and think about each of the sets as an orientation and a tool pair that can actually remove a, a certain number of dots, right? If you, if you remember that part that I showed, if you come from top, you can access and reach certain sub volumes. You come from a different cutting tool, a different orientation, and would represent a different set. So then the search becomes very, very straightforward once you actually build these sets, which we, which we do in the previous step. And all of those actions correspond to a set of voxels or the removal volumes that uh, to each tool and orientation combination can remove. Then what we do is we pose it as a set cover problem and find the minimum set, which would correspond to minimum number of setups and uh, to, to be able to cross the part. So here is an example. If you come from the top, the blue volume is what you can uh, see with the cutting tool and access collision free. If you come from this direction, uh, you know, well, maybe from the bottom, I don't remember. Uh, it's a different sub volume. If you come from, from this direction, it's a different sub volume, right? So we compute each of these once. Uh, we put them in the bucket, as I said, and then we employ the search uh, by, by looking at these set intersections. That can be very complex. It's, it's pretty fast. For what? Right. For uh, I'll, I'll show some examples. Um, if the part is complex, right? You have a lot of these pieces that you have to cover. Uh, and then no, you have to cover the complexity. It, it is a complex. We do a, lot, a number of different tricks to to make the computation efficient. So we. We, uh, we, we, we use a beta A star search. Uh, we have a pretty greedy approach to uh, do. For those of you who know search and optimization, so in, in any kind of A star, you have to come up with a G function and a H function. So we look at whether the part is manufacturable in a greedy, greedy, uh, greedy fashion. 
and then that becomes actually a part of our heuristic. So, um, is this you know wor is any action worse than the the the, the uh, worst possible action up to that point? Is basically uh, how we do this, and we do manage the complexity of the space by um, by using the open set. So we specify we prescribe how many nodes in the search tree uh, we will have at any given point. That's about 200 right now. And uh, each of the nodes corresponds to actually an action, uh, a, a negative volume that, that can be removed. And obviously, you want to go from the raw stock to no remaining volume. All of the actions, all, all of the sub volumes are covered in your in your recipe, in your trajectory, in that you. This is a different tool that you need to cut. What's that? If you have different tools that you need to involve, or if your plan right. tells you to get different tools, right. and if there are precedence constraints. And which tool does you have first? Mm -hmm. it can that be representative? It, 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 yes. In other words, I want to build a ball first, and I want to polish it, and, yes. and I have to do it in a certain way because otherwise it won't work. Right. Why is it represented here? It, it is not represented in what I've shown you. We do that by tying some of the tolerance information, precision information. If you have to do, I don't know, beaming or center drilling and those kinds of things, we have uh, uh, ways of append that to the process plan that we have generated. So that's how we can actually for that. But there's no generic way of really coming for that, unless you want to go with each case. So. Um, no, and that's why I think it, that's why I think go with Right, and we have been talking for quite some time for still looking at hybrid, hybrid ways of, you know, but we wanted to build a mathematically sound generic solution first before imposing any kind of heuristics and you know, future based things, which we are doing right now. So um, some of the tricks for scalability, like I said, so. We actually do, if you have a long tool roster, we actually do some selective sampling from that space because if you have a thousand different cutting tools at your roster, you know, uh, that, that basically increases the branching factor of that search tree. So we, we consider heuristically some of that depend on the feature size of the part. Um, and then our open set is 200, um, and, and we can expand that if we want to look at much larger space. Uh, actually. So, um, some of the stuff that we compute, this is pretty much the textbook of manufacturing engineering. So we looked at uh, material removal rates and the power of the machines and suggested to come up with the suggested feeds and speeds and those kinds of things. Uh, we also look at the, the pair of the tool, cutting tool, carbide tools versus non-carbide tools, and the workpiece material to, uh, to really feed some of the recommended feeds and speeds and things like that. So, um, what I want to talk next is, is quickly um, how we validate this. You know, how, how does it perform compared to what is what else is out there, and then um, how to validate some of it. So we have been employing, being a part, you know, we've been innovators of uh, corporate ethnography, ethnography, which is basically observing end users interacting with a proposed technology and really using a feedback and studies in informing how to build the technology feature set. And we've done this uh, exact thing for, for this particular technology, as I said. So we had about uh, a dozen different partners, that, ranging from large OEMs to small companies and small medium manufacturers, to give them the UFAP prototype and have them work with it and tell us what they like, what they don't like. A lot of customer pilots, and then they, you know, they basically inform us uh, about the value, uh, whether we're not solving the right problem for them, what kind of value we should expect if you we're successful solving that problem, and that avoids a lot of revisions. You know, rather than a bunch of scientists envisioning what the customer wants, we actually ask the customers what they want, and then build the technology accordingly. Um, we have been doing, you know, we have been working with uh, with a number of them. So this this is a very very partial list because we have NDAs with most of the partners. <coughs> the ones that you see on this slide is the uh, is the uh, is the public ones um, that we work with. Some manufacturing SND organizations. Uh, we work with DARPA, obviously, for part of the EMBI uh, proposal, which we propose to further the UFAP uh, tool, as well as some, some partners to the ABM program so far. So, in all of that, also, we did a lot of benchmarking. So, this was with one of the suppliers. We got about 100 actual parts from them, uh, and we looked at how well we track in, in estimating the manufacturing time and, and cost. So the red line here uh, traces the blue line with the actual supplier data. So that we did pretty well uh, with this particular with this particular supplier. In some cases, that wasn't the case as expected. You know, we weren't as accurate as we wanted to. So in that case, we inserted the machine learning layer, analytics layer, if you will, 
that um, tries to estimate some of these parameters. So the manufacturers, when they come up with these process plans, there are a number of um, unobservable parameters that they pick. You know, they, they, they make assumptions about the tool sizes, the setups, the removal volumes, some of the process parameters. And UFAP, in the process planning and evaluation phases, represents all that stuff. But we look them up from you know, recommended best practices and those kinds of things. Doesn't necessarily mean those are the actual values that this particular manufacturing manufacturer will, uh, will, will use. So what we said was, well, is there any way to sort of declaratively capture this and look at not just one file, but a bunch of examples. We're going to get the cat file, and we're only going to observe the cost from which we're going to infer shop-specific parameters um, so that we can improve the accuracy by minimizing the error in observed cost and, uh, and estimated cost. And that's what we did when, you know, here's some of the parts um, that sort of should give you an idea about the complexity with, uh, with another supplier. So before we did this exercise, you know, we were about un grossly underestimating how much time and what cost it would have. After we did this exercise, you know, the, the, the black lines are the actual codes from this particular supplier. The blue lines are what you found estimates after doing this kind of calibration, if you will, and we were within 13%. And, and this was just only with 16 examples. As we increase that, that examples, um, we can actually learn much, much better and uh, fine-tune our evaluation parameters to get to a uh, desired level of accuracy. And this is very, very important to be able to do because we want to eliminate the RFQ process. I mean, that's one of the objectives, right? So if we can guarantee that we can actually code for them within 5-10% accuracy, they can build that into their margins, and then all of a sudden that, over, that overhead is, is, is automated. Um, I'm running a little bit over time, so I'm going to spend three, three minutes and three more slides because I want to give you a little bit of a feel for some of the extension work that we've been, uh, that we've been doing. So what I'm showing you so far was sort of DFM analysis, high-level planning, estimation of uh, manufacturing cost and time. But we don't, want to, we don't want to stop there. We want to give these shops uh, much increased automation capabilities. And in order to do that, you have to link from, from coding and high-level planning more and more into the CAM work, you know, computer and manufacturing. You have to be able to reason about you know, fixing the tool, actual tool paths, the machine programs that they have to run. Um, and that's what we've been working on. So we have been working on automated fixture planning for each of the setups that we compute um, we look at the library of uh, fixed tuning devices, modular fixtures, wise devices, as in this example. It's important, obviously, you're cutting metal, so you have to come up with the appropriate fixed tuning scheme so that you can um, resist the cutting forces uh, that would happen during the cutting process. So that's a different level of reasoning that we do uh, in, in, in which we compute these, uh, the red elements here, and this is a wise device, which is common. Um, these are some modular fixtures, clamps, edge clamps, and things like that, that you have to put the part to fix it so that it can restrain, restrain the cutting force. So we're doing this in an automated fashion. Is it done by catalog or by model? By what? Is it done by catalog or by actually the model by and all that? Yeah, by model. We do foreclosure and force closure, and then we map that to the forces that we calculate. We guarantee and then you choose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing is we also are going from you know, the plans and the fixturing schemes to CAM. Uh, we do that using a, a, one of the most common CAM tools called MasterCAM. They have an API. <coughs> what we're doing is, we, you know, we're doing the high-level planning setups and orientations and machine selections. We feed that into MasterCAM, and uh, MasterCAM computes the, the, uh, the tool paths and actually spits out the machine codes. Uh, so that's an important step if you want to go all the way down to executing and running machines in terms of automation. And then the final project, that these, this is a different project, the previous one is a different project. And then the final project I want to mention is, um, my computer does it crash. The other thing that, uh, that was brought up by, uh, by the shops was the notion of scheduling. Because they don't get one part at a time, they get multiple parts at a time. They have to have a means of understanding the current kind of utilization of the resources that they have, all the machines, etc. And um, we have to be able to link our process planning with a scheduling engine so that we can increase their productivity. And that's, that's another project in itself that we have been working on um, to be able to increase the, the level of automation. And, and my computer uh, is about to crash, I think. It's just sort of thinking that. I'm going to stop there and, 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 and get questions. Thank you very much.
I, I, I had to do it for two years, otherwise I won't get my diploma. Because I'm both a mechanical and electrical I had to construct a sphere by hand, kind of two minutes. And I learned about power heating before I was able to come into the clock. <laughs> Any questions? I, I have a question. Yeah. If you take a very complex system, at the design stage, you use either regressive analysis or maybe take a very simplified global analysis. Then you create a CAD drawing and then manufacture it. But how do you close the loop when you bring a very detailed, multi functional analysis, very comprehensive analysis into it? So you basically go and basically change the design itself. Right. Okay. Because yeah, so, so there's, there's, there's multiple aspects of that. To me, that goes back to the requirement. Right? So, and there's different types of requirements that you have to do in the analysis. You know, if, you, if you really have a sort of a close the feedback system into the design, you have to look at different metrics of performance, you know, thermals, acoustics, what have you, requirements. Uh, we do some work in some of those areas to do, you know, simulation, verification, those kinds of things, looking at the requirements. We do additional work in looking at risk, and reliability, and safety, and those kinds of things, you know, in a base system as well. The way I view what I talked about is yet another metric that about being factual. So I think that design feedback is not, is, is, is basically multifaceted. So you have to, if you have a trade-offs between how you design things, you have to be informed by how manufacturable it is, how safe it is, how reliable it is, how well it performs. And, and that sort of, a, that builds your trade-off space. Uh, and you have to decide you know, what, you, what you want to get. That's, that's how I view that. So what I presented is a part of that, but it, won't, it, it is not powerful enough to answer that by, by itself, because it only looks at manufacturable. You have to do integrated product first design. That's what you have to do, and you have to do multidisciplinary organization to trade it off. So. Because, because you have to do a very good thing. The component why this is very good. Right. But when you assemble the thing, right. that component may not work. Yeah. You can do IPVD at different uh, scales of aggregation, actually. So, on, on that note, so this is piece part, the scheduling piece is where it moves from one piece to multiple pieces. But it doesn't necessarily mean those multiple pieces are part of the same assembly or something, right? So, because you're a shop, you may get, you know, you have five different customers, they, they all send you different piece parts. We have another project, which I haven't talked about, which looks at the assembly planning, collision free assembly planning, and it tries to assess, well, if, if I, if I um, assess that I can make all of these parts, and they need to go into a certain sequence order in, in, to an assembly, What's the optimal assembly sequence, and what are the associated paths? You know that that research is a lot of robotic path planning, and those and computational reasons, and those kinds of things, so that we can take those piece parts in an optimal order and put them together in a feasible fashion. So that's we have a separate project for that. Any other uh, questions? Any other questions? Just a comment based on your optimal order of putting parts together. I know from experience that. Um, there are certain parts, for example, on the 757, there are some valves that were modeled and they were supposed to be able to be put in, but it turns out they didn't really model like where some of the hands would go when they did it, so very, very difficult. Yeah. But the real question is this, if I have, because now you can have all the computational power you need, could you do this, could you do this before you make a system screw? Check it to figure out the, uh, the entire IPD so that it can do it like in time biology. That it, it, it does the, the assembly, so you go and you don't have to worry about it. Is that possible? I think it's possible. I mean, that's one of the things. In fact, I didn't get to my last slide, which was. Well, that's a dream. I mean, you know, to give you an example, just remember the movie. The Iron Man, Iron Man you see it, that goes into this, and he's surrounded by the computers. And they measure him, and they make the uniform, and they, they select the material, and they him up, they create the energy source, and then up she flies. Right. That's the model. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's the beauty of uh, virtual simulation. That's so you, know, you, you want to make sure that you can make it and build it and assemble it before you even do anything. Right. So now, Boyd claims that 777, the way to do that, uh, is a paper disguised process that everything was designed, even the testing of the software and the hardware and everything, before they, they create a single screw. Of course, it cost them millions of dollars and thousands of people and thousands of computers. That was 12 years ago. 
77, they said they, be able to do, they were able to do it much more economically. But we are less ambitious. If we can do it for small things, like doing robots and stuff like that, would be useful. Right. Yeah. And, and the key is going to be this, this interplay. Exactly the question you asked between design and manufacturing. Because you may design it right, and then you try to make it, and you cannot make it at, at the parameters you want. You have to change the design and so on and so forth. So. Any questions? Okay, now I have a question. Everybody should be able to answer. Do you think it's difficult to make doors and windows and lights and things like that? Is that difficult? How many manufacturers do you have that make this kind of thing? So how come every time you build a house, you always fight with your architect? It's because of this. Because you know the components, but you don't try to put them together. They're not exactly put together the way you want them. And it's still, uh, even in the simplest case of manufacturing, which is building a house, right? It's still a, a iterative process which involves humans. Now, architects will claim that they take you to a 3D CAD tool and they will walk you around the house and they will show you how it looks, and that's how it's going to be when you manufacture. That's not exactly how it happens today for houses. For bridges and other things, probably it is. So we are very back. To the, to the now, I, I want to, me to mention that we have a long history with Park. Some of you are too young to know, uh, including you. Uh, we used to, uh, Harold Paul, the late Harold Paul, who used to be the vice president of Park, was involved with us when we built the institute. He was part of the advisory council. And he came all the way from the West Coast many times to help us in organizing the institute. And uh, I remember when we had the site visit, they asked him why you are here. He said, because this is the most important city in the world. And they said, no, 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 seriously, these people are very good. And they actually wrote a paper about how we built our institute. That's a classic, how we built cross many units. And then Mark Stetik and uh, Johan de Kier, who works with Olga, and John Sidney Brown, they had the famous Core Lab project in the park where they were trying to understand how to use computers to help people collaborate in design teams. Now comes the second question. From the seven people they had in the project, if I tell you they had two categories of people, psychologists and engineers, what was the percentage of psychologists, what was the percentage of engineers, and why? Sixty forty, because they found that when you make too strong the computers to help people each other, people refrain from collaborating because they're afraid they will recall what I said 10 minutes ago and so on and so forth. We actually may have still the talk by Max Stephen, we can get a talk about the Collab project. What you could do in the Collab project, you had active boards and active computers on the table of the integrated product team. And if you say something, I can say either five minutes before you said this, how can you say that now? And then people kind of go back, so they got the psychologists to, to try to balance between uh, the computers and the people to help collaborate in design. And they applied it to actually design the work It was a big, uh, a big uh, achievement that uh, saw that this could be done, and they claimed they had used their design by almost another month. So we have a long history of that. And I'm glad you're coming back, maybe we can restart it. We had a lot of collaboration, a lot of people going back and forth. So so yes, 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 yes. That, that, um, one, one opportunity is, uh, I, I'd love to continue that, and we talked a little bit about how we can do that, but you had mentioned internships, so we do, we do work on a lot of systems problems, and yeah. a, lot of, you know, a lot of the similar types of problems that you guys are thinking, on, uh, thinking about quite heavily. So if anybody's interested in, in coming and getting a flavor for you know, industrial research for systems problems, um, you have my contact. And they actually run the whole gamut of what we apply, what we based in engineering, from healthcare down to screws and uh, hammers. Okay. There will be a uh, round table, four to five, informal, please come. And if you want to meet with Dr. Pluto, he's going to be here. And he looks for the airport. Okay, let's take a minute.